Moving on, and Google has rejected claims that one of its programs had advanced so much that it had become sentient. The Washington Post having reported a Google engineer saying that after hundreds of interactions with a yet unreleased AI system, he believed it had achieved a level of consciousness. The engineer, Blake Lemoyne, was immediately placed on administrative leave. This after he said the system had perception of an ability to express thoughts and feelings equivalent to a human child. Joining me now from New York is Dr Kate Crawford, an artificial intelligence specialist and co-founder and former director of research at the AI Now Institute at New York University. Dr Crawford, firstly, thank you so much for your time. This sounds like the stuff of Hollywood science fiction movies, but in your opinion, is it likely? Well, I hate to say it, Annette, but this really is not sentient artificial intelligence. In fact, Lambda is really just a very large chatbot. And of course, we've had chatbots like this for many decades. And while they can seem intelligent, if you're conducting a conversation with them, they are in fact just trained on large amounts of text that's drawn primarily from the internet. But, but should we be worried? We know not at all, because I think the reality is that these systems, in terms of the way that they engage, are really not much more complicated than very large statistical analysis at scale. So there's nothing specifically about the way the model is working that we should be worried about. Instead, perhaps, we might be more worried about the types of biases or stereotypes that are very commonly built into these models. They are famous for producing forms of speech that are very hateful or full of misinformation or dehumanizing language. And actually, that's a much harder problem for tech companies to solve. Um, so actually, that's where a lot more of the attention is focused. So given what you've just said, Dr. Crawford, was Google's response appropriate? Well, I mean, I think in this case, uh, Google are probably just as confused as the rest of us in the sense that they know very well that this model doesn't have a soul and isn't sentient. But what is interesting here is that, you know, many engineers are certainly hearing the same marketing and publicity that is being put out there by tech companies saying that we're close to achieving general artificial intelligence. I would suggest, in fact, and this is why I wrote a book called Atlas of I on this topic, that these models are neither artificial nor intelligent. They are, in fact, just built of huge amounts of dialogue that's been extracted from the internet and then is basically just producing different sorts of responses in relation to what you say. And interestingly, we could go back to the 1960s, where a very famous AI professor called Joseph Weizenbaum created the very first chatbot called Eliza. I'm not sure if you ever used Eliza, Annette, but it was a very well-known chatbot that felt like it was really responding to your questions. And people genuinely believed that this was an intelligent system. But in fact, yet again, it was just a very simple piece of programming where you just respond to questions with different kinds of questions and answers. So in fact, this, this type of hype around artificial intelligence really has been around for over 60 years, and we're no closer to creating real intelligence. Having said that, do you think we will ever reach a point where that Hollywood sci-fi will become reality? <laughs> And that I'm much more concerned about the types of harms that these systems are already doing the world in terms of discrimination and bias in things like the criminal justice system or education or healthcare. I think we've got much, uh, shall we say, more real term concerns that we should be focused on rather than this fear that we might be creating something like HAL in 2001. It's really a long way off if we ever get there. Coming back to what you say, of course, are the major real-time problems for people working in the field of artificial intelligence. Is it the case that when it comes to ethics, Dr Crawford, and artificial intelligence, that the horse is well and truly already bolted from the stable? 
Well, we can certainly say that in terms of the amount of economic investment and legal regulation around AI and ethics, we've had much less than we need. So certainly what we'd like to see over the next decade is far more attention placed on the social, economic and political downsides of these systems. And this is one of the things we're starting to see, of course, in the EU with its forthcoming AI Act, which is in fact the world's first omnibus piece of legislation focused on AI. And that's a real indication now that we're starting to see the EU take these sorts of downsides of AI very seriously. But again, it's important to note here that these are downsides that are occurring now in terms of discrimination harms, in terms of ways in which people's opportunities are being impacted by AI. The concern is not that these are sentient beings. As you've just explained there, the EU is in the process of drafting legislation, but I know that you've been advising governments. In your opinion, what should governments be doing immediately to address this issue? Personally, I think there's a lot that can be done that's low-hanging fruit in the legislative domain. Right now, we don't even really have individual rights of action against a system that might prevent you from getting a job or getting into a school. And we've seen lots of instances where there have been protests against AI systems that have been coming back with incorrect grades for students in the UK, for example, or actually producing discriminating results in terms of refugees trying to gain access to particular countries across Europe. These are the sorts of test cases that we're seeing. So legislation really needs to respond by, first of all, creating these rights of action. But secondly, I would say by creating more systems of transparency so that we can see how these systems are working. For example, trade secrecy law is commonly used as a way to prevent researchers and auditors from looking at how an AI system is working to see how it might be producing forms of harm. So there are certainly ways that we can address that with law um, in ways that would certainly help us figure out the both short and medium term effects of these kinds of systems. And, and finally, Dr Crawford, another element of this is public awareness, isn't it? It's educating the public and understanding the limitations, because there are limitations associated with this technology. There are very clear limitations, Annette, but there's something also important that's going on, which is in order to create these very large models that we're starting to see, for example, um, the one that Google is using is called Lambda. There's also a system called Imogen. OpenAI has created a system called DALI2. These are vast machine learning models that cost an enormous amount of money to make and burn a huge amount of energy to run. And if you look at the world, there are really only a few companies that can afford to build things at this scale, and certainly very few universities can can compete. So what we're seeing is a system where more and more power is being put into fewer and fewer hands. It's now an extremely concentrated industry. So the sorts of questions that I think we need to be asking are, what are the kinds of democratic implications where just a few companies really get to create the systems that are remapping the world and telling us really how things should look and how they're named? I think this is something that we should be spending a lot more time thinking about. And that, as you say, is ultimately a question for the public. Dr Kate Crawford, thank you so much again for your time. It's a pleasure to be with you, Annette. Thank you.